So welcome to the Louis Talks podcast, where I talk to interesting and fascinating people that I've met and connected with throughout my career. So this week, I've got a very special podcast on, in fact, something that I was going to post just before COVID and the lockdown happened. And I felt posting it while it was going on just wasn't quite right. So this week, I've got a guest on with me called Jason Gibb. Now, Jason has had an amazing journey of starting his own food startup in the olive oil world, all the way through to setting up Bread and Jam, which is an amazing festival that celebrates the very best of food and drink culture, the food and beverage industry, and really tackles some things head on when it comes to the problems and the bumps that you have when really starting to grow an F&B brand. So Jason and I get deep into talking about all things food and beverage from brand and marketing all the way through to what's happening in the industry at the moment, current trends and looking into the future of where we're seeing things moving and and where some of the challenges might be to grow a food and beverage brand. Now, although this is very F&B focused as a podcast, hence me not wanting to release it just before COVID happened and while the lockdown was happening, I just felt that I've got quite a few friends and clients that have really struggled throughout this period. And although I know a lot of F&B brands and many other industries have really taken the advantage of going digital and being able to deliver, for some companies that just wasn't possible. So I, I just didn't feel right to post it. But I think now as we're starting to come out of lockdown, things are starting to go back to normal. Pubs and restaurants are opening back up across the UK Many retailers and delicatessens are starting to open back up. So I I felt like this was the perfect time to bring back this amazing conversation that I was lucky to have with Jason. But as I was saying before, this is very F&B focused, but we also talk about business in general. We talk about marketing and we talk about some of the challenges that I think ail many businesses, not just in the F&B sector, but across the board. So I really hope that you enjoy this one. It was recorded late last year and so there are a few things that we mention about the events that you'll now have to go and check with Bread and Jam Fest to see what they're doing as I'm sure things have obviously changed after Covid but um, I absolutely loved this conversation with Jason. He's an absolutely fantastic guy, a real inspiration to me and so many others and he's such a great network of support that surrounds bread and jam and also their facebook groups and many other things so yeah i hope you enjoy this interview as always if you've got any comments suggestions thoughts that you want to let me know on please do message me on linkedin or any of the social media channels this podcast is going out in both video and audio and so for those of you watching on youtube there will be a link down below where you can find all of the audio channels and vice versa. If those of you listening on podcast, you can also go to YouTube and find a video format of this interview. So please enjoy. So good morning, Jason. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast this morning. I've been wanting to get you on for a while. Uh, as you know, I'm a sort of food entrepreneur myself from from long past. And um, I love what, what you and, and Bread and Jam are doing. So to start with, I'd love for you to tell the listeners and watchers out there exactly what it is that you do and how you got into it. Well, uh, I have a few different hats, but specifically uh, Bread and Jam is a two-day conference for food and drink entrepreneurs focused on giving them the the, the training and insight and support that uh, smaller businesses don't often get an opportunity to to, to have. Um, So we do two days of amazing talks, panels, workshops, uh, retailer pitching, pitching to funders, loads of amazing things that that basically help emerging and scaling food and drink FMCG brands. So if you've got a product that you want to sell in a shop, our kind of community can can give you the training and support. So we've been doing this kind of one uh, two day festival for the last four years, uh, every October. And then since this year, we've also been running lots of kind of smaller events throughout the year, evening workshops. We do mental walks, which is like a really nice start to the week on a Monday morning. Uh, we go for a walk before work through a London park with three mentors who are kind of experts in a particular subject whether it's, I don't know, getting into speciality, speciality retailers or whether it's funding or whether it's um, branding. 
uh, and we take a nice kind of informal stroll through a park. We do one day boot camps. Next year, we're going to, it's, it's all been actually quite London focused so far because uh, myself and my co-founder Tara are both based in London. But next year, we're going to run some events actually outside of London for the first time, which is quite exciting. And so, yeah, that's the Bread and Jam Festival. How I got into that is, you know, quite a long, long story. Let's see how far back I should go. I was actually originally a scientist. Um, I did a PhD in, in biochemistry. Then I got into kind of television, science television. I wanted to kind of make programs, environmental programs, actually, that kind of told people about this was like 20 years ago. We we're talking about, you know, the, the climate crisis, which is now, you know, obviously talked about a lot. But not many companies were making uh, TV shows that, that were um, sharing this kind of information. So I ended up working on an engineering game show. We called it called Scrap Heap Challenge. I don't know if you ever saw that. Yeah, you're, I you're did. Probably yeah. Too young. No, I yeah? did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of Sunday evening viewing. And um, that was a fantastic experience. Did that for 10 years. Ended up in L.A. actually um, living there, making a version of Scrap Heap Challenge for US TV called Junkyard Wars and ha had a lovely lifestyle, lived uh, lived in a nice house underneath the Hollywood sign and, you know, making lots of money and a very kind of nice but ultimately shallow, in my opinion, existence. And that's also where me and my partner, we discovered uh, Californian olive oil. We used to go down to the farmer's markets every every weekend and try out the local produce and we, we discovered we, we didn't really know much about olive oil and we discovered all these amazing varieties of fresh harvested extra virgin olive oils and we started experimenting with kind of infusing them with different flavors and and cooking them in cakes and doing lots of different things with them and we'd both kind of come to a point in the tv career where we we'd had enough and we wanted a change so we're like well stop this let's go make olive oil and you know, luckily, we're, we're two people who are kind of up for changes and up for experimenting and up for trying things. And so we were like, yeah, let's do it. Where should we where should we go and make olive oil? Let's we want to move back from California. So we want to go to Europe. So let's go to Greece or Spain or Italy. And we, we kind of did some research into it. And we thought yeah, Italy is the, the most interesting for us. But we didn't you know, we didn't speak Italian. We didn't really know anyone in Italy. And but we're, I suppose one of our skills with making TV shows was that we could pick up subjects quite quickly. And we, you know, we're good at picking up the phone, finding out who the right person to speak to is, researching it. So we eventually found this abandoned olive grove on the east coast of Italy in a region called La Marche, which has for the last 20 years been the new Tuscany. It's, it's really beautiful, rolling hills. And yeah, we found this abandoned olive grove. We moved out there in about 2004 and um, started making olive oil. Found local experts who could show us how to press the olives, all that kind of stuff. We're, we're you know, again, we're good at finding the right people to help us. But we also quickly learned that olive oil is quite a difficult product to sell. The margins are pretty crap. Uh, no one understands why one olive oil will cost like five quid and one will cost 25 quid. You know, what's extra virgin? What's yeah, first cold yeah. press? The, the consumer wasn't very kind of knowledgeable. So it's quite a challenge to sell olive oil at a good price. And making olive oil is really labor intensive. It involves a lot of labor. And so it's expensive if you do it properly. And so it's kind of hard to convince people to, to buy half a liter for, you know, 10 quid, 10, 12 pounds. So we took, again, we took our skills from, from kind of TV world and applied it to to this new venture. And that was kind of storytelling. So you know, what, what, what's the narrative of this olive oil? How do we how do we make it more than just this commodity? So we came up with this idea where you could adopt an olive tree, and you get sent the harvest of oil from your tree. And you could come out to Italy, and you could hug your tree and we'd show you around the olive grove and, and all, all this kind of stuff. And uh, so we used to, to kind of start this food business, we used a lot of instinct and a lot of skills from our previous lives. But we had, you know, we had none of the business skills. And at that point, there was very little support for people like that, especially, you know, we we're stuck out in rural Italy. So it was even harder. You know, I had 
no ideas about margins and insurance and shipping and supply chain and all this kind of stuff. And there, there, was, there was nothing out there. So we made loads of mistakes and um, learned on the job. And then one, fr one friend of mine, a couple of friends, actually, they, um, they started a, a dinner club in London. And it was, you know, it was a very informal thing, but it was like a founder's dinner. And there were some really cool people there. They're like the founders of Rude Health and Goo and Peppersmith and Cafe Pod and uh, people like that. And we'd all sit around, have dinner and, you know, just share experiences and share our war stories and, and share our contacts. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm, I'm sat in a, surrounded by people who are going through the, you know, the same struggles and the same crap as me. And it was lovely finding my kind of tribe. And so that was always at the back of my mind, you know, that great experience. And so anyway, with the, with the story with the olive oil, the, the, the business, Nudo, I kind of did that for, for 10 years. We moved back to England after a few years and it was relatively successful. We were in loads of speciality retailers. We were in Waitrose, but most of our business was direct to consumer. About 80% of it was direct to to consumer and about 70% of it was in the States actually. They really loved this kind of narrative of the adopting the tree. They could, the, the English were slightly cynical about it, <laughs> um, but the Americans were like, oh my God, that's so cool. And it, you know, it went around all the Hollywood circles and loads of famous people, um, Barbara Streisand adopted olive trees and Tom Ford and, you know, various famous people. And then, but by, by, you know, year seven, eight, I was kind of, I'd taken it as far as I could. And it was kind of, it was, it was quite a strange experience because all the relationships, all the people that I worked with, uh, uh, at the end, our olive grove was only able to supply a small amount of the oil. So we worked with 14 different producers. And my relationships with them were very personal, very friendly. We'd have lunch together. And ultimately, their kind of their olive oil was a bit too expensive to make a really good business out of it. I would have to be a lot harder with them, and I wasn't willing to be harder with them. So that was um, that first kind of business was too close to my heart, and I couldn't take it any further. After a while, and I kind of began to fall out of love with it. And so ultimately, I I um, found someone to to buy it off me, which was great, and they were able to kind of. Uh, keep it going and, and build it around their 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 expertise. So it, it still still goes, and so um, it's quite a long and convoluted story, isn't it? Um, no, it's great. It's, it's a, so, an amazing journey. <laughs> so then uh, sold the business, and again, you know, because it was such a part of me that was like quite painful. Yeah. To be honest, it was it was really painful handing it over. I felt a lot of responsibility for the for the um, for the people that I was working with, uh, my staff. And it wasn't it, it wasn't fun. The, the whole process of selling a business is, is quite tricky, and the power plays and the money and the the buyouts and all this kind of stuff. It was it was pretty horrendous. So um, that happened, and then um, then we were lucky that my my partner as well. She kind of uh, finished her her job. She went back into TV actually, and so she finished her job, and we were. We were free for a while, so we, we went traveling around the world for seven months with our three kids, during which time I was meant to work out what I wanted to do next, but I didn't think about that at all. I just had a freaking amazing time. We traveled all around China, Australia, all around South America, North America. It was uh, an amazing experience uh, with our three kids. So spending that quality time with them was just awesome. So then I came back and, and this kind of idea of that kind of founders dinner, that support network was was at the back of my mind. I spent about six months just basically networking, meeting everyone I thought was interesting for coffee and just chatting and getting my head around the industry. And 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 obviously I could see that everyone was was facing the same challenges. Everyone stumbled at the same stumbling block blocks. It was, you know, it was about accessing buyers, it was about funding, it was about upscaling production. These were very common themes. And another thing that I realized is that people are really willing to share their experiences with other people. You know, one good thing about struggling your ass off is that if you can help someone else not do the same mistake. So I started up a Facebook group called the Food Hub Forum. 
I don't know if you're on, you're on that. Yeah, I, I have. I am. And actually, um, I was talking to a friend yeah. today who's got a business called Trios. He's based in Wolverhampton, and I know he's quite active oh, right. on the group. And I've got a few other clients. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, so that was a kind of experiment in saying, okay, well, look, how collaborative is this community? How willing are we to share information with, with ultimately people who are strangers? So I, I invited, you know, the hundred or so entrepreneurs that I knew in this industry uh, onto this kind of closed forum and the information was just great. And then so organically in, I don't know, like three years, I suppose, it's grown to over 7,000 food and drink entrepreneurs on there, um, sharing really good information, sharing great support, sharing great advice. It's very collaborative. It's all very positive. And so that's just grown organically. And and then also four years ago, so actually the Food Hub must be four years old as well because that started slightly before Bread and Jam. So Bread and Jam came out of a kind of a, a meeting with, with Tara May who um, has kind of done food startups and was running a, a food and drink accelerator, a small accelerator called Kitchen Table Proje- Projects. And we're like, well, let's, you know, let's try an event. She had done small events before had no experience of events, but I knew what people were struggling with. I knew the questions that needed to be asked. So I put together a kind of a, a content program of all the things that I thought were the, the, the main pain points where, where people could learn and, and get information um, that they needed. And so we did that, yeah, four years ago and we did our fourth year this year and it, it's it's grown, it's become, you know, a bit of an industry, you know, event that you need to go to if you're if you're starting or scaling. It's helped loads of people. Uh, the feedback that we get from it is amazing. Loads of loads of um, listings have come out of it. Um, the retailers love it. And um, it's been a really good experience. But, you know, I don't want to, I also want to make sure people know it's not all positive. I want people to know how hard it is. You know, I don't, the first year we had a lot of speakers who were like, oh yeah, all you got to do is work hard and be passionate and you'll succeed, which, you know, is obviously bullshit because you need loads of other elements in place. So since then, I've, I've tried to make sure that people are fairly realistic about what they're talking about. You've got to be honest. Uh, let's be honest about this. So, um, yeah, so that's bread and jam, how bread and jam happened. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, like I said, just before we start the podcast, it, it really amazes me how much support is is starting to be there, I think, for business in general, but, you know, specific to the food and drink industry, because, you know, I started back in 2004. Um, you know, we were out in the West Midlands in the countryside. There was a local food group that were, you know, OK. We got a few delis and things out of their, you know, their support. But really, you know, you were on your own. And much like you, it was just a case of meeting other people in the industry. And I think it was only then doing things like the International Food and Drink Expo. Our first one was in 2007. You know, I I probably spent half of the show walking around talking to other food producers and just saying, well, how does it work? How did you get into this retailer or how does the distribution work? And, And so you know, very manually just trying to to go and talk to as many people as I could. And then, you know, we learned very quickly because we went from, um, you know, my my parents' garage in 2006 to um, all stores, Waitrose and 350 stores, Sainsbury's within 12 months, you know. So it was was sort of a really quick growth. Um, So, you know, 2007, it was 165 chocolate boxes. December of the same year, it was 100,000. So, so we made a huge amount of mistakes, mm. learned a huge amount of lessons. And I just think the food and drink industry has always been, I feel, and I'm, I'm completely biased, obviously, but an incredibly exciting place to be, an incredibly challenging industry to be in. And I just think it's amazing that there is more support out there. You know, and, and I suppose to, to kind of kick things off, I'd love to know your thoughts on, you know, where the food industry is is at the moment. Because I I think when I first started, the food industry had always been challenging, but I at least look at it from the perspective that I feel when I started, actually, there wasn't that many competitors, you know, in, in terms of at least my industry, chocolate or other friends who are in different parts of the food industry that, you know, you had competitors, but, but they're, you know, there was still this sense of camaraderie within the food industry and and but i just 
feel like over the years it exploded. I mean, certainly for my industry in chocolate, it got to a point probably by about, I don't know, 2010, 2011, everybody and their dog seemed to be making chocolate, you know, and, and lots of other industries had the same sort of thing that, you know, popcorn would, ex- you know, become a trendy product. And then suddenly you go to the IFE the next year, there's 35 companies all doing gourmet popcorn. So so I, I feel like actually probably today it's even more challenging than when I started. So I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on that. Well, I think I think you're exactly right. Like it sounds like we started at a very similar time. And I kind of think the market was different then in that you could kind of make mistakes on the job a little bit. Like, you know, my first listing was with Selfridges and I, I had no idea about like margins or pricing yeah, or, or yeah. anything. And and actually with, with that, I um the Selfridges approached me. They said, you know, we want to stock your your olive oil. We, we, we love it. Like, we love the branding, the story. And like, you know, the buyer said, how much do you want to sell it to me? What's the cost of it? And I was like, well, my thought process was, you know, online, I sell it for eight quid. So I'll sell it to Selfridges for seven quid. Um, so I sold it to, <laughs> to them for seven quid. And then I kind of, a few months later, I, I, um, I took a trip back to, to England and visited the Selfridges store. And I saw it for sale for 20 quid, 21 pounds yeah, in Selfridges. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it's never going to sell. And of course it didn't sell. And then the, the buyer found out that, you know, I was selling it for eight quid on online and was like, what's going on here? And that's, that's how I learned about margins, the wholesaler margin and their yeah, margin. Yeah. And, and nowadays, you're right, it's so competitive, you wouldn't get away with that kind of thing. Yeah, but yeah. we were able to get away with that. So people now have to be so much more prepared so in that sense, it, it is much more challenging, much more competitive. I still think it's incredibly collaborative. And I think that even people competing for the same space are quite good at clubbing together because it's almost us against the big guys. But I, I think there are loads of different factors in play, really. You know, there's obviously the, the, the supermarkets. They're screaming out for innovation. They're screaming out for differentiation. The main supermarkets are getting challenged by the discounters and by the uh, online retailers, and they need to find products that make them stand out. So they are, in theory, incredibly hungry for innovative new trends. So there's a huge opportunity there in Sainsbury's and and, and, uh, with a future brands team and Tesco's and their incubator. But also you hear kind of pretty bad stories about brands that are, are, are being launched in those kind of spaces and the brand owners don't realize the amount of funding you need to support it. You know, getting it into the retailer is one thing, but getting it out of the retailer into the customer's hand is a completely other thing, another thing. And I think so many brands underestimate that the marketing budget that you need. And then, of course, the big multiples aren't always the ultimate aspiration of people and i think there are a lot of people who want a a smaller business you know a low volume high margin business and you can do a great um you can do a great business retailers the farm shops i think they're going from strength to strength you know obviously provenance and founder story is all very important and obviously that's another thing that has is helping emerging brands is, is you know the millennials the social media the fact that Millennials are much, much more likely to, to buy from from brands with real people behind them than from corporate brands. They don't trust the corporate brands. Social media has meant that it's much easier to communicate directly with the brand owner. And that has leveled the playing field to some extent, you know, because if you're pretty smart, you can do a lot of great marketing for very cheaply on, on social media. It's maybe become harder with the way you know Instagram for example is is working these days but it, it's still it's still a great opportunity you know a great it levels the playing field somewhat yeah so uh, what other trends am I seeing um, I don't I don't know really that's that's what I'm 
thinking of at the yeah, moment. Sure. I mean, I, I think it is, it's interesting, isn't it? Because as you're saying, I, I at least saw that there was this initial very, very exciting period in the food industry, which I think I caught the wave of as it sort of rose and managed to get my listings. And very much like you had absolutely no clue what I was doing when approached Waitrose. Was very lucky at the time that the buyer kind of held my hand and, you know, led me down this process. Um, Sainsbury's again did something very similar. But, it, you know, it's weird. We sort of had this golden few years and then there was the 2008 crash and we had a, a couple of dark years when all of the retailers rolled back everything. They didn't want to buy things. They weren't interested in artisan product it was all just about margins and, and recouping some money and I kind of feel like it's sort of now you know over the last few years it's sort of gone up again where like you're saying actually you know millennials wanting to buy from human brands social media leveling that playing field from a marketing perspective you know because for us we you know we used to have to spend a lot of money on marketing and because obviously you know that social media wasn't really a thing back then you know we 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 were very lucky that we had a lot of PR, but apart from that, yeah, there, there were huge costs associated mm -hmm. with that marketing. So I think you're right. You know, it's I feel like it's a very exciting time now, and I think more people than ever are wanting to buy real products from real people and yeah. meet the makers and have that provenance, which you know, as you say, is becoming ever more increasingly important. I think in the food industry. So, so I guess I, I'd love to know from your perspective, you know, in terms of the, you're saying the questions that really come up for food producers, what would you say still are some of the sort of biggest challenges and, you know, the, the most asked things that you get from, from the food industry? Accessing buyers is obviously, a, you know, a huge thing. Um, there's, especially with the larger retailers, there's a lot of kind of stuff going on with the reorganization of buying teams they're becoming much more pressurized um responsible for bigger categories responsible for more profit um so there's a load of strain on them and and there's this kind of real friction between buyers and producers the producers on the one hand are like you know i've got a great product i'm sending it into the who i think is a, i found the right buyer mm -hmm. i've been stalking them on linkedin <laughs> sent in my product and i don't hear anything and like, you know, I just want some feedback. Is it the right buyer? Is it the right, mm. is it, is it, is it the right product for them? Is it, are they reviewing? Is there a category review going on? Did it arrive on, you know, in not broken? And then they're like, why can't they just, you know, why can't they just tell me whether they got it or whether they like it or what they think? And then from the buyer's perspective, it's like, you know, 5% of my time is dedicated to, to new, new products, especially mm, yeah. kind of from small producers, I don't have time to, you know, I got two, you know, 200 emails a day from new producers, loads of new products. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to um, reply to them all. And if I do reply to them and say, actually, the price point is, is not right. They'll come back to me and say, yes, it is right. Yeah, or, yeah. you know, they'll, 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 that'll start a dialogue, which then takes a, up a load of my time. So this is a real, in the industry, it's a real grating point. And, I think that I can see the perspective of both sides. And actually, that's one thing that we do quite well at Bread and Jam is all the major retailers um, send buyers down, the speciality retailers and and uh, the, the larger multiples. And you can apply to pitch your product to them. And maybe 100 people will apply to meet the Cardo buyer. And the Cardo buyer will then look at that list and they will choose 20, 30 of them. And then they get 10 minutes face to face. And in 10 minutes, you can kind of get a very good sense of whether this is going to work or not. And so uh, it's an amazing opportunity for the producers and the retailers love it because they can uh, meet, you know, 20, 30 really good brands in a very short space of time, which would normally take them, you know, a long, you know, days and weeks. So that's one, yeah, yeah big, big issue that still hasn't really been solved, but we, we're trying to do it in our own little way. Manufacturing oh my God, we get so many issues about manufacturing. I, I kind of seen over the last few years from when I started, may, maybe same with you, I kind of thought that a lot of people made their product themselves and they would they would scale, scale it, they would move out of the kitchen, they'd maybe rent a little factory or build something. But now the trend seems to be very much outsourcing the manufacturing, which, yeah. which, is, which is great in many respects. 
Uh, you're getting a specialist to do it. You can concentrate on sales and marketing, new product development, and they kind of do do all that side for you. But of course, you kind of lose control and you lose a bit of margin. And, you know, so there are two sides to it. But it seems that that is new people coming into this space kind of automatically think that they need to find a manufacturer. And I think the manufacturing industry has been slow to, to catch up on this because there's very few people who are in the kind of space where they can deal with smaller manufacturers and smaller runs of products. And so there are a lot of people looking for manufacturers who will work with them and take a punt on them. And um, there's also, you know, you find a manufacturer, uh, you find out what kit they have, and they take your recipe, and then yeah, they do something yeah. completely different yeah. with it. Because... Yeah. They're used to doing something a certain way. They don't really want to change. Uh, they got the certain type of equipment. Mm -hmm. And so there's always this kind of issue with like, oh, shit, you know, we did our first trial run and it's a completely different product. Yeah, yeah. Um, so and and also, you know, I've the, the last couple of years I've been burnt like uh, three times in manufacturers. I'm I'm working on a vegan uh, brand at the moment. And it's, oh man, I've been going through the mill with it. It's, it's, it's really difficult. But I think that there is, a, uh, there is a new breed of manufacturer who are kind of setting themselves up to do small pilot runs and small trial runs. And this is a great thing that we're, we're seeing in the industry, but um, it's still got some time to catch up. There's also, there's very poor resources for finding manufacturers as well. Someone yeah, needs to yeah. kind of create a directory. There is one kind of corporate organization that just doesn't seem to be kind of fulfilling this role, but it's something that I've often thought about how we can kind of help people with this. Um, so yeah, so that's, so yeah, accessing buyers, uh, manufacturing, you know, funding, you know, this is another thing that people are uh, finding difficult or, or um, you know, crowdfunding for the last few years has been a real cash cow, an amazing opportunity to kind of value, run a business for a few months, value it a million quid, and then get loads of people to kind of um, yeah. put in money at yes. a completely over over, over egged um, yeah. valuation. Yes. Yeah. Now that that over the last year or so, I think I've seen it kind of become more and more difficult. Yeah. Uh, um, you um, you have to now go to the crowdfunder with 60, 70 percent of the money in the bag and crowdfunding is seen as a kind of top up, uh, essentially. Yeah. Um, and, you know, crowdfunding campaigns take a lot of time and time and effort. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's difficult. There, um, there are loads of loads of also one of the kind of knock on effects of crowdfunding is these valuation, this kind of valuation issue yeah. where people will then kind of go to VCs and angels saying, you know, this is the valuation of my business because I've seen so-and-so value their business on, on Crowdcube for two million <laughs> quid. So, you know, if I want a hundred thousand pounds, it's 5%. Yeah. 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 And then, like, you know, <laughs> anyone in the know is like, you know, that's ridiculous. Yes. Yeah. So, um, I think, you know, that, that is a, that is a big challenge. Um, and I think people underestimate that, how much money you need to, if your aspiration is this kind of huge, you know, challenger brand, you need money to support it. Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, there are hacks, there's the ways to do it much, much more leanly. Um, and some people have managed to do that, but yeah, it's, it, it's something that, uh, a lot of people struggle with. So we do, again, we do lots of, lots of, uh, we do workshops on this kind of thing, uh, bread and jam. We do, you know, how to raise seed money, how to raise, raise kind of first round money, how to prepare for exit, all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, so they're, they're the three main challenges, I would say, that, that we're facing. Obviously, you know, Brexit is, um, yes, yeah. is, a, is a big challenge. I think that that has had so many different implications around the world, whether it's around our ecosystem, rather, whether it's, it's to do with importing our ingredients or yeah, our yeah. products to exporting them to mm. um you know just the, the 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 impact on the on the market i think you know it's everyone's slowed down um everyone's much more cautious again manufacturers are much more cautious uh, waiting to see what happens so yeah
yeah in, in, interesting i mean i think i think it's 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 fascinating as well i think from from growing my own food business and now kind of sitting back and and looking at others helping others grow and i i think to pick up on those two points very quickly the manufacturing is an interesting one because i think when i started people didn't really go out there and outsource straight away. Like you said, it was just like me. I started in my parents' kitchen, moved to the garage, moved to a production unit. You know, you gradually, slowly grew and and scaled. Now, that has its own huge challenges and limitations because although it's great to be in control of your product, it's not always great to be in control of loads of staff. Um, And there are inherent challenges within that, that you have to learn to be a leader. You have to learn, you know, about HR. You have to have a good lawyer. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things in there. And I think it always interested me that my um, I was always compared uh, when we started out with Fraser Doherty and we used to have lots of kind of these strange, uh, you know, chocolate boy versus jam boy type right, things yeah. and, and articles. <laughs> and, and I always thought that, you know, Fraser was incredibly smart to have that really good manufacturing partner from the start that allowed him to scale, you know, so quickly. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we were kind of the opposite is that actually we were always limited by you know, it was us making everything and eventually we did outsource. But after a good number of years, it was probably, you know, six years or so before we even started to outsource. So, mm. so I think it is interesting that, like you say, I mean, I, st- I still think you're right. It would be great for somebody somewhere to come up with a resource to go and find manufacturers and, and outsource. Um, and I think that you're right. There are a couple of organizations out there, but I haven't really seen anyone do do something that is good enough and um yeah, that that's a definite thing, um, you know. And and I think, I think well, one thing I wanted to say was that um, you know, there's no one way to skin a cat. Yeah, yeah um, And so for some people, outsourcing might be the right thing. For some people, building a, a their own kind of plant and controlling it might be the right thing. And actually, when we do we do panels on this kind of thing at Bread and Jam, and I always get people who've had completely different experiences to kind of talk about the pros and cons of, of each direction. And I think, you know, there is no one formula sure. that you need yeah. to follow yeah. that will guarantee success. It, it really depends on your situation and, and stuff. Sure. And I, and I think it's the same with buyers, isn't it? You know, in, in many ways that, uh, you know, I know that I was very lucky like you to be in the very early stages of uh, artisan food products. And therefore, I think it was probably a lot easier to get to buyers. But, you know, but over the years, you you just had to get really tactical about it, um, you know, and and figure out different new and innovative ways to reach out to the buyers. Video cards, hampers, you know, all all sorts of different things. You're just always trying to say, well, actually, how, how can we do this? Because we have got to stand out from the crowd we have got to find a way and you know yeah you'll never get better than meeting somebody face to face so i think you know it's amazing you know that you guys have got such an amazing forum that you know people can come and meet buyers because like you said sometimes that's all it's about and i and i still think that thankfully we live in a world that we we do business with other human beings not robots so mm-hmm. that's an incredibly important thing to to get yeah. that sort of first human connection um, um- Another thing that we do at at Bread and Jam, which um, I think is really invaluable, um, we do this thing called the tasting panel. And uh, we get three buyers, uh, one from a supermarket, one from a speciality retailer, and one from a deli. And you get 10 minutes face-to-face with them, with your product, to get feedback. Because you never get feedback. It's really hard Mm, to get, you know, okay, I I want to pitch to you, but I also want to know what you think about my product so that I can improve it. What do you think about the pricing? What do you think about the branding? What do you think about the messaging? And that is a, a real good opportunity. And of course, you know, what the three different buyers are looking for could be, well, would be completely different. Sure. And it depends what you're, you're heading for. But yeah, I think breaking down that barrier between the, the, the buyer and, you know, as you say, adding some human faces into it and i think that that's one mistake that a lot of foods um do they don't treat the buyer like a human yeah yeah you know they are just be sensitive to that man it's like they're busy people they they're they need to know the right information quickly and sending stroppy emails to them saying <laughs> why haven't you replied to me does not does not help no sure 
Yeah, I, th- I think it's, you know, and, and I say um, uh, to a lot of people that I work with and, and uh, you know, I, uh, like like you, I sort of do events, but across businesses. So I think it, it applies for anything. But I think one of the things that we just got really good at doing and I suggest it to lots of people is just data capture, you know, get a really good CRM system and, and try mm. and collect as much data from these people as you can. And, you know, I think as long as you're using it in a genuine way and we used to send birthday cards, Christmas cards, wedding anniversary cards, you know, children's birthday cards, because what we were always trying to say is you're still a human and we understand that. And actually just seeing you as a means to an ends between me and my money is obviously not going to be the right route. And and actually I, you know, I would only expect that a buyer buys for me because actually they like me. I mean, obviously they have to like the product and it has to sell. But first and, f- first and foremost, that relationship has to be with me. And as you say, you have to appreciate and say, this person, they're a busy guy. They've got hundreds and thousands of producers to deal with. And mm. and actually, you know, am I just, and, and I think for me, I always say brand has the job of moving from transaction into emotional purchasing, whether it be B2B or B2C. And to create that is a really important first step is to say, well, actually, I, I want my buyer to be buying from me, not just because they're looking at a sheet and they say, OK, he's hit the targets this month. We'll buy some more or no, he hasn't. We'll bin you off and, you know, bring the next one in because that's their job. Right. You know, their job is to to make revenue for the stores. So, mm. you know, looking at it from their point of view, rather than trying to take it into a relationship where, as you say, bringing them into that process and saying, well, tell me what you think you know and and way before we release new products we'd send them out to all of our buyers and say honestly what do you think you know here's here's a box of them try them taste them um and we'd work with retailers often to to try and create things specially for them you know that Mm. that fit their marketplace so yeah i I think did did you do much with um food service because i'm just kind of learning more about that at the moment and I, i wonder how that differs yeah, so we did do quite a bit with food service. I mean, I think the challenge is that obviously within that, the the brand is kind of stripped away because, it, it, you know, a lot often it's just bulk boxes. I mean, obviously, we you know, we used to do chocolates, uh, you know, truffles, things like that. So it's just a white box, kilo, you know, by the kilo to the food service. So I, in that respect, I think our our strategy was just to be innovative and different. So, you know, we used to do a lot of very weird and wacky flavors that people just couldn't get elsewhere. Um, Mm. And sometimes I was always open to actually creating loss leader products that would get in the door, build a relationship. And then um, so we used to do durian uh, truffles for whole foods and uh, oak smoked pancetta truffles way back and all, all sorts of weird and wacky things because... You know, for me, that was where we built the relationship. Now, we didn't make money from most of those products, but it was just a case of saying, what is it that you want that you can't get elsewhere? Maybe we can work together with something. But then the sort of relationship started to build. And then we say, well, actually, we then have all of these other products that are kind of bread and butter stuff that are just your champagne truffles or whatever it might be that, you know, kind of everybody has. But because that relationship's there and they know they can come to you and say, oh, I need a, a, you know, masala chai truffle can you make one yes yeah. no problem yeah. well actually i'm kind of more inclined to then buy your your peppermint creams i mean i could go to lots of other suppliers to do that but you guys kind of bail me out when i'm in trouble yeah. so it's that kind of like 80 20 rule where 80 percent of your revenue is from you know 20 percent of your SKUs. and certainly when we were doing olive oil I, I followed the same principle we did lots of weird and wacky flavors we did we did, actually did a cocoa nib um, oh, nice. olive oil where we pressed cro- cocoa nibs together with the olives in the olive press. We did that with Amazing. coffee beans, wow. uh, with mandarins, and we'd make all these kind of quite unusual flavors. And of course, what they also serve as is is marketing, isn't it? I, I saw them as kind of marketing things. So Absolutely. it's a story. You need to keep on telling the story and, and yeah. getting it out there. Absolutely. I mean, I think on the other hand, what you've got to be very cautious of is, is having too many skews. I think it's a natural progression of a business that you you start off with your core products and then someone says, oh, can I have this and I can I have that? And then but before you know it, you've got 50 different products and 50 different types of packaging and all this stock that you're carrying. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And you've got to then consolidate. And I, I th- see that as quite kind of traditional um, growth um, curve. Yeah. But yeah, you've got to really make sure that you don't 
um, carry too much stock and make make things that aren't going to be aren't going to necessarily sell. But also another another kind of benefit of it that I've seen is that sometimes you come up with a product that then becomes your core product. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, she's kind of got these nut butters, and she, for the first time, she's she's done this. Um, it's not really related, but a ba- it's basically a vegan panettone. Oh, nice! Uh, okay, and it's just flying, man. And 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 she's like, well, you know, maybe this should become my core product. She, you know, she just did it on a kind of whim, um, meeting a supplier who could could manufacture who could do it for her, and then so you never know what's going to come out of those those yeah, I- exciting. And the other benefit is that it keeps you and me excited. Yes. Because I yeah. love doing new products. Yeah, you know, that's sure, on, you sure. know, as a fa- food founder, you're like, oh, yeah, what can <laughs> I try? You know, you're creative. You want to create something new and exciting. And, and that's a real buzz. You just got to make sure that you, you've got it under control. Absolutely. And and I definitely didn't. I think in the early days, we, we, we ended up with about 4000 different products. So, you know, I, I definitely, <laughs> definitely made that mistake early on. But, you know, you, you definitely learn from it. And I think, as you said, it, it was interesting, actually, because um, my head chocolatier came up with a flavor for chocolate bar, which was uh, what, um, milk chocolate with strawberry and vanilla. Now, I, I've got a real aversion to strawberry flavor, didn't want to do it, kind of let him do it and take take control Um, and I think probably in in the maybe eight years of producing that bar I probably ate two of them collectively but they were our bestseller for for eight years so I think as you say sometimes it is interesting that out of these things come products and and it's about keeping that balance between innovation because I think that is something that the food industry does incredibly well it's an incredibly exciting creative and innovative industry but like you say it's then learning okay, I do need to balance this because if I'm making thousands of different products and I'm then losing control of my margins, you know, I don't really know what's selling and who's buying what and, and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting. But like you say, um, we used to use that towards the end as, as the real PR, you know, is that we used to, I mean, there's a, a really good example where we were working with Selfridges. Um, they wanted a, a really sort of high-end Easter egg um, for an anniversary. I can't remember which one it was, but it was a good number of years ago now. And and we create we sort of created this completely bespoke chocolate egg. It had 22 karat gold foil on it and all this sort of stuff. And I took an artist with me to the meeting. And as they were talking, he was sketching out the packaging that then we had digitally printed and... Um, we, we did this, wow. you know, sort of fabulous Easter egg. And, and I think, I mean, they were something crazy like, I don't know, £185 each. Um, mm. I think we sold about six of them. But we got in, <laughs> you know, every magazine, yeah. Yeah. Harper's yeah. Bazaar, Telegraph, you know, it sort of plastered all over. And I think because at that point I'd learned we digitally print everything. So actually there's not loads of packaging sitting around. For us mm. to knock up something like that in, in the unit was very easy. Um yeah. So I think if you can balance it and figure out a way of creating a bit of innovation, but digitally print or do something that allows you to innovate in sort of short, sharp bursts, stay very agile um, Mm. and be able to react. Because as you say, you never know that that next thing that you do. I mean, there's a really good story about um, the company. I think it's, it's either Doritos or Cheetos. I can't remember which one it is, but the janitor of the the factory in america you've probably heard this story um, i but, haven't know okay no, well the, so that the, the janitor was uh, a, a mexican guy and he basically said to the kind of the management team and he said look you know your kind of chili flavor actually if for us is just you know weak it's it's you know that it doesn't actually appeal to the latino market and so this janitor said, actually, I would love to develop a sort of like super hot chili, you know, habanero kind of product specifically aimed at the Latino market. And they did it and they allowed him to do it. And now he's one of the chief product developers. Um, and, you know, and, and and it was one of their best selling lines in, in the States. So I, I think yeah. it's, you know, it is it's this sort of agility and being open to that innovation because um, mm. you never know where it's going to come from. Um, and I, I think... The next thing I'd, I'd love to touch on you with is, and it's because it's something very close to my heart, is uh, export. Um, you know, from starting the company to eight years later, we ended up in 17 countries around the world. And I think because, you know, I 
I didn't think too much about it. I just kind of went out there and, and made made it happen. Um, but also realized very, very quickly that we have an astounding brand presence globally. You know, Britain does as, as a whole. And I was at um, a British Chamber International Export Conference recently. And, I, and I'm trying to remember the statistic, but it was something like four or seven percent of SMEs in the UK export as opposed to 35 in Germany. So I think actually, you know, you know, as not just the food industry, but as a whole, the SME sector in the UK is actually very poor at exporting. And I think we do have a bit of an islanders mentality that, well, this, you know, this is the only market. And I always tell the example that um, in 2009, I was pitching to a buyer in a gross in a small grocery store in the UK. I spent two hours with them and they bought 10 cases of product. My dad simultaneously had gone to New York to the Fancy Fine Food Show and he was with a buyer for 15 minutes and they bought three pallets as an introductory mm. order. You know, mm. and we were literally sitting there on either end of the world and I'd got, you know, probably a couple of grand out of it total and he'd gone and secured, you know, three full pallets and then there was another mm. nine that followed it. So so I think that there is a massive opportunity for British businesses, particularly food industry. There is a real want and a need for it globally. And of course, the, the obvious ones, America, Canada, Australia, you know, we, we did well in all of those, but actually our best export market was Mexico. So I think sometimes it can be those real weird and wacky, um, untraditional marketplaces that you've probably never even considered that could mm. be the, the the best place for you. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on, on the whole export piece uh, around the food industry as well. Well, I, I totally agree with you that we do food and drink really, really well. I was with some French business yesterday afternoon, actually, and they were saying how, you know, we're perceived as real innovators and really creative in the food world. And I thought, wow, that must be really tough for a French man to say. But <laughs> um, I think that we're great at branding. We're great at spotting new trends. Obviously, you know, maybe our traditional foods aren't so strong, which has meant that we've taken in loads of stuff from around the world. Um, so, so, so yeah, I, I think there's a huge, huge opportunity there. I suppose my kind of words of caution would be that there are a lot of people who kind of get approached by someone from a wholesaler in the, you know, uh, United Arab Emirates or in the States or wh wherever. And it, it can be a little bit of a distraction. I would always, I suppose my advice would be, and, and again, it's not, there are many ways to skin a cat. My advice would be to kind of really work on the UK domestic market first, build a solid uh, base there, solid manufacturing infrastructure, supply chain, uh, good customers. And before you then go and, and go outside, sure, yeah. um, you know, we like, like you, we did a lot of stuff in the States. We were at the fancy food show. It's, it's freaking huge, man. It's really yeah, overwhelming. Yeah. And the States is huge. And you got to understand that the States, for example, is it's not like one country. It's like five or six different countries with, within that that you have to treat separately and then of course you know if you want to make a good gerva you have to support it i think you can you can rely on you know we used to get regular oil uh, orders for olive oil from an australian company and it was relatively easy when we set it up and we knew what the right paperwork was was for it and they were it was quite lucky in that they would kind of they found a market for it and they would support it and we didn't have to do anything. But I think a lot of the time you do have to support your product yeah. in that market. But nevertheless, loads of opportunity. Again, what's going to happen with Brexit? God knows what. The exchange rate's pretty crappy, so it makes it uh, much more difficult. But it's a great, a great opportunity. And, and I kind of always thought that, you know, the States and Australia and Canada are very good first steps because you don't need to, well, you speak the same language. Sure, yeah. You do have to change your some of your labeling because um, the requirements will be diff different there. But there's quite a lot of support out there for kind of knowing how to do your kind of US compliant labeling or, or whatever. And I think so that, that they're, they're really good. And I never did much in, in kind of continental Europe, so I, I don't know that, that market so well. But certainly at Bread and Jam, we've had foreign buyers come and, and, and 
I was speaking to this French company yesterday, and they're going to bring over some buyers from France uh, next year uh, to Bread and Jam. Um, who, you know, they're very, they're very keen on finding the, the the trends that are coming out coming out of the UK. Yeah, so so there are pros and cons cons of it. Yeah, sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah, and I completely agree. I mean, you know, we again made a lot of mistakes in in the export side of things. I think one of the things you learn quite quickly is, you know, outside of probably America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, contracts don't really mean a huge deal, you know, and, and that, that's one of the big things I think to learn is, you know, we got burnt a number of times because you think, well, I've, I've got a piece of paper, you know, with somebody's signature on, but actually, yeah, right. you know, it turns out, I mean, you know, the, the first buyer that we had, the first distributor in Mexico burnt us quite badly um, and we had a lawsuit going on for two and a half years and it just kind of got dismissed because, uh, you know, that's just how it is over there. So, yeah, absolutely right. There, There is a lot to learn. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes export can be a little bit challenging to begin with. It's finding the right people, the right buyers. And, you know, every, every country is slightly different in the way, like you said, they want to support. I, I do just wonder that I think a lot of uh, businesses have ended up exporting into, the, into Europe. And I think maybe with Brexit, it might encourage the odd one to kind of say, well, actually, maybe we'll export, you know, further out. Maybe we will go out to to other marketplaces because I think the only opportunity I see, which, you know, is not so great for them, but maybe, you know, not so great for us, but better for them is that I know that I've got a friend who's who's been in the Chinese market for a very long time and he's talking with a lot of sort of Chinese business partners and they're all going, actually, we can't wait for Brexit because we can go over to England and buy loads of stuff really cheap. Um, <laughs> so, mm. you know, they're, they're selling a lot of British beer in China. I think they're doing about um, 50 or 60 grand a month just uh, through the sort of um, kind of Chinese Amazon equivalent, you know. And, yeah. and it's, so, so I think I think there is... You're right. There is opportunity out there. But again, it's about finding that support network. For me, it was the British Chamber. But yeah, I mean, you know, there's lots of other resources out there. But um, I do always try and implore businesses once, as you say, they've got a good domestic market there. Their mm. bread and butter sales are sorted out. I think export is a, you know, is, is a good place to, to go to go. Out I agree. To. And I, I suppose the kind of the, the, the word I would use is just be cautious. Like yeah, you say, sure. you know, Make sure that with these new relationships, don't kind of invest too much time and money in them and make sure you get paid up front for the first kind of shipment. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, those kind of obvious things. I think, you know, people get really excited. Wow, I've had this inquiry from the other side of the world and they want two pallets and, I'll, you know, I'll do everything. And and also one thing I kind of wanted to t talk about actually was, was kind of like pricing. You know, you've got to make sure that you – it sounds obvious, but you've got to make sure you're making money from these deals. Don't go into a new deal thinking, okay, yeah, well, I'll treat that, you know, I'll give them a good price just to kind of get things mm, going and yeah. and actually not make any money from it or lose money from it. But you, you've got to make sure it's what's the point in doing business if you're you're not making money, making money to cover your costs and survive and you know feed yourself. Um, so steer clear of, be cautious and steer clear of any kind of vanity export projects and any vanity projects in, in, in general. Yeah. And there was a good story on the, the, the food hub the other day of someone who was saying, you know, Hollander Barrett want to put me in 200 stores and that their margins are infamously high. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, should I do it as a kind of marketing exercise? Mm -hmm. And luckily the general consensus on the food hub was absolutely not. What's the point? You know yeah. what? You're just making their money, their money and working your ass off. For no profit or even a small loss he said um and i think we we've got to make sure that we've got to be very disciplined in the way we do business and make sure it's worth every kind of bit of work we do yeah yeah definitely um so jason yeah, sorry <laughs> yeah no not not i mean i think I'd, i guess i'd love to, as sort of parting advice um because i've i've got you know, quite a few clients at different stages in the food industry. So I'd, I guess, you know, past all of the things that you said and the challenges, I guess, what would your advice be to either a startup food industry brand who's thinking about getting in the industry but probably isn't there yet or somebody who's kind of getting going and in that awkward, I've mm. got something, I've trialed it, tested it, but now what do I do? What, what would be your advice to them? 
Um, well, I mean, you know, there's there's small bits of practical advice, like you say, you need to you, you need to market, test your product, you need to get it out in front of people who are just beyond your friends and family who aren't going to tell you the truth. To be honest, you need to put it in front of people who who have to pay money for it and get their feedback. So do markets, do tastings, do markets is the main thing because that's where people will pay for it and you can learn a lot about that. Then in terms of, you know, branding and all that kind of stuff, I, again, there are loads of ways of doing it, raise loads of money and get someone like B&B Studio to, to, to do it or do as little as possible to get it to the next stage. And I would generally kind of prefer that kind of attitude get friends and get pull in a favor with someone to do the basic branding, get your product out there. The smaller speciality retailers are, are much more inclined to kind of take things that look a bit kind of artisanal, go to your local delis, persuade them to kind of sell it for you, uh, support them with taste things. Then, you know, there's a kind of a fairly standard route that works, you know, try and get it into planet organic whole foods, um, sourced market, then try and get it into maybe booths or um, then, you know, iron out all the creases, then make sure you got all your packaging compliant and your your manufacturers working, working well, then take it to a cardo where you get kind of national distribution. It's a tiny kind of market. It's one to two percent of the supermarket market, but you get national distribution. Um, then you can ramp up your marketing. Then you take it to a bricks and mortar kind of retailer. Yeah, if that's what you wanted to. But another thing I kind of wanted to touch touch on, and I wanted to know your experiences as well, it's kind of like building the team. And I kind of feel quite strongly about how you should, if possible, don't do this on your own, find a co-founder. Or if you can't find a co-founder, surround yourself with people who've got industry experience who are kind of critical, who can be critical friends, or, you know, on your boards or kind of independent advisors or non-executive executive directors I kind of you know I've done it a few times I've built a few businesses now and uh, it can be very lonely and I think you do a lot better if you're you've got someone by your side uh, who's got your back and who you want to impress and they want to impress you and um, I think you shouldn't be scared of of reaching out for kind of expert help I think there are a lot of sharks out there with mentors and consultants so you've got to be careful always kind of get opinions from other people and recommendations. But I think surrounding yourself with people who can, who've already got a lot of knowledge is, is a good, good thing to do. And that's what I've done with um, this vegan brand that I'm, I'm doing. It's all about kind of building the, the right team of complementary skills and experiences and people that I like and trust. Um, I would never work with friends though. Um, that's one thing. I, my personal thing is that I kind of think that, um, I mean, they can become friends. Sure, yeah, yeah. But I wouldn't say, oh, me and my best mate are going to go and uh, do something because I think, well, for me, friendship's more important and I wouldn't want to ruin that. And I think it's, it's you're going to go through good and bad times. Sure, um, yeah. And I think it's easier if there's, you're not going out to the pub after after a day of work and you're going separate ways. I think that's that's easier. What what did you kind of bring in people to to help you with your kind of that growth stage? Yeah, definitely. So I think I one of the things I got really good at doing early on was collecting mentors, uh, and I had mentors in all sorts of weird and wacky industries. You know, sort of investment, finance, branding. I mean, all, all sorts of things. I, I think for me, probably one of my best you know first mentors was a guy called Robin Smith who um, he was a big part of Saatchi in Saatchi, New York for about 15 years, came back to the UK. And his first brand that he built uh, was The Body Shop with Anita Roddick. So I found oh. him kind of early on, I think I was 14, 30, yeah, 14 when I met him. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I, I really found these people, like you said, and brought them in because I think, I think you're right, there's a lot of sharks uh, and people out there and we, and we lost a lot of money through you know, bad consultants and uh, all sorts of different things. And I I think that the key is that, you know, they, they must have done something before. They have to have had a food business, built a food business, grow, scaled it. Because I think there's, I've certainly seen in the last probably seven or eight years, there's a huge myriad of business coaches, consultants, mentors that actually haven't 
really ever built a business themselves you know they might may have been involved in something or worked for another or worked for incubators or whatever it might be but I think the danger is that if they haven't actually had the practical day in day out experience of what it's like to to have those bumps knocks mistakes lost money you know all those kind of things that especially I think when it's your own money that you flush down the toilet it makes you wise quite quickly um, you know, and, and I think that's something I really learned from is that then, you know, I had a lot of people around me, but, you know, I also made a lot of my own mistakes. So, yeah, I can completely agree. I think sometimes it's finding people that have done it before and, and that comes in a, in a myriad of different ways. I mean, I, you know, I think I was lucky that, you know, most of the people I work with um, did it for for not necessarily free, but maybe exchanges, you know, where I would help them do something, they would help me, they'd give me advice. Mm. And, and we had this really nice reciprocal relationship. And I think at least when you very first start out, that's what I would do if, you know, if, if I was to start a food business again is to go out and say, right, who can I find in this industry that I can find some way of swapping, even if to start with, it's just sending them a hamper of chocolate every month or whatever your product is. And then maybe that relationship might grow in the future. But um, yeah, absolutely right. You you can't, I don't think you can have enough people in, in your business or board that have had experience before because you know it's it's the they've they've got the t-shirt uh, mm. they've been there done it and uh, it's you can circumvent a lot of mistakes by talking to them um, mm. and and we certainly had that in the export world as well just having those people there that said well actually you know I've I've I'm a British guy I've been doing a business in China for 25 years this is how it happens these are the things you need to be mm. you know worried about and so, yeah, that, that was absolutely invaluable. So I completely agree. And I think, like I said, you, you do have to be wary that there are a lot of sharks out there. But find people that have got genuine, provable experience in, in the industry um, or the field that, that you want to be in. And that's actually where the, the Food Hub Forum comes in really useful because you can kind of talk to, to people who've, who've worked with, you know, you can get recommendations. And I think that's really valuable. Yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, Jason. I mean, I I'd love to know. I kind of ask everyone on the podcast this: books, podcasts, you know, any resources that you might recommend for people to go and and follow, um, listen to, read books. You know, whatever it might be, where they can sort of collect some of these uh, nuggets of information. Okay. Um, so I mean, my favorite podcast is uh, How I Built This with Guy Raz. Don't know if you know that I one. I don't it's actually an, know. It's, Oh, it's awesome. It's an NPR one. Okay, yeah. And uh, how I built this, and it's basically interviews, um, very nicely researched kind of interviews with um, with food, uh, not with, no with founders out of any industry. Um, I once had a kind of I had to drive down to Italy, and I I listened to about six in a row. <laughs> it's just the most joyful experience ever. And I came out of that kind of journey like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. So motivated. <laughs> um, David Hyatt, uh, How to Build a Mission uh, Driven Business is one of my favorite books. What Shall I Do With My Life by Poe Bronson. Don't know if you know that one. I don't know. It's, no, it's, no. it's, a, it's a quite an old book. Kind of, I was reading that in the early days of, of kind of leaving TV. Uh, what Shall I Do With My Life, I think it's called. They're the ones that kind of come off the top of my head. Uh, at the moment, to be honest, I'm reading a lot of books about climate change and uh, the climate crisis. And that's that's what's next to my bed. Sure, sure, yeah. Kind of <laughs> and um, what what is next to your bed at the moment then? Oh God, I can't remember. I'm so <laughs> bad with names. I can't remember. She's an amazing American author who wrote the book No Logo. Oh yes, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. I can't can't think of the name, but yeah. If if you send me the link afterwards, I'll okay. put it in the show notes. Okay, we'll but, do. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And uh, Ch Charles Eisenstein. I don't know whether you know Charles Eisenstein, but he does some very interesting work um, on kind of a economy and climate change working together, and and how we need to see a, a difference in value to to our you know our climate economy. But right. um, yeah, that's the, he's got a good number of different books that are, are really great around that subject as well. Um, I, th I think that's another thing that maybe just as a parting, you know, statement conversation, whatever you want to call it. But I, th I think that one of the greatest things that really the food industry did for me was make me aware of my, of the world around me, you know. And, and I think that having 
I, I grew up in a very small village. The food industry was all around me. You know, cows disappeared in the field opposite. The butcher had more stock. You know, it was, it was sort of very, very, you know, relational where potatoes were pulled out the fields and the greengrocer had them. So I think I was quite lucky to grow up in an environment like that where I got a real sense of what the food industry actually is and mm. supply chain and all that kind of thing. But, you know, I think I definitely think that the food industry does make you more aware, you know, because obviously you're looking into and you're researching into products and where it comes from and provenance and ingredients. And Mm -hmm. you start to become aware of the supply chain, you know, how ingredients are shipped all around the world and the air miles and all of these contributing factors. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that, you know, I, I, I think that's a great gift that the food industry's got to give people is to make people more aware of their food system and where it comes from. And social media is helping ever with that, you know, to to bring people's attention to certain aspects of the food industry that are good and bad, you know, and and bringing attention to it in in the kind of wider general public sense. Um, I mean, actually, before I forget, there's the most incredible podcast by a guy called Miles Irving, who's a forager. And he's got a podcast called the World Wild Podcast. And right. for anyone interested in, in, you know, some natural foods and um, just ecology, uh, biology and, and how ecologies work together in, in natural landscapes, that's an absolutely stunning podcast with so much knowledge in it. Oh, brilliant. I'll, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. sure. And the, the book that um, is Naomi Klein. OK, yeah. yeah. And um, and. The book is called uh, This Changes Everything and it's Capitalism Versus the Climate. And there's a lot of good stuff about how basically globalization, um, so going back to kind of exporting to China, has has basically buggered the planet up, yeah, really. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we've basically outsourced our carbon dioxide production to, to China and India. Um, yeah. You know, that's why we're able to hit our targets because all our goods are manufactured el- elsewhere. Yeah, um, yeah. But um, so that's what I'm thinking about a, a lot these days, especially as I got you know three kids and and um, I think about their future and and I strongly believe that you know the 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 single most thing we can do to mitigate climate change is to cut down on our on our meat and, and dairy. I mean you know cut down as much as you can. Um, if you don't want to compromise it all, don't. But d- d- try and make some change yeah sure well great well thank thank you so much jason really really good to to chat to you really enjoyed it there's so much information in there and um yeah just finally kind of where people can find you social media websites and anything like that just plug plug away so yeah so if you want to join the food hub forum um go on facebook search food hub forum i think a few different ones come up but ours is the one with seven around seven thousand people in there uh, you request to join and then we'll we'll let you in. And Bread and Jam, it's breadandjamfest.com. Um, we've got a few events that we're putting together for 2020. So there's a kind of calendar of, of events. But join the, sign up to the newsletter and we'll keep you in the loop of what happens. We're doing a, a monthly social event, a uh, free social event from January um, at the Camden Grocer uh, in London, um, which always good and an opportunity to kind of touch base with other food and drink entrepreneurs and yeah so come and join the fun yeah sure fantastic thank you jason yeah hope hope i can send some more people your way to help out top man lovely to speak to you yeah you too thanks so much jason cheers cheers louis bye